Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our evening gospel service. We're just going to have a short time of gospel community singing just before we start. If you've got your hymn books, uh, it's number 224. The hymns will be shown up on the screen beside me. Hymn number 224. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Some technical difficulties. It's better that than me singing a solo.
We're now going to sing one of the hymns from our youth chorus book. I heard an old, old story, and it just tells us of how the Bible is the inspired word of God, and yet how old it is, it is ever new. It never goes out of date, and it is never wrong, as it teaches you can have victory over death, in and through Jesus, living that perfect life of obedience and taking our place on the cross. I heard an old, old story. I your hymn books it's number 304 on the page 229 or 299 we are never never weary of the grand old song
And just over the page to number 305, will your anchor hold through the storms of life? in prayer, let us pray. Our gracious God and Father in heaven, we bow humbly and reverently before thee. We come nigh once more to the throne of heavenly grace, conscious that thou art the God of all grace, and that thy grace is sufficient for us. We cry to thee that thy grace will abound towards us, that thou wilt draw very near unto us in this gospel service this evening. May we know that thou art in our midst, and we ask that thou wilt enable us to preach Christ in all of his fullness. Oh, that some soul or souls, on hearing the word of life, would come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Keep our meeting covered and protected by the precious blood. We ask these things in our Savior's name and for his sake. Amen. We're turning to the hymn 243 in your hymn book on page 274. Sinners Jesus will receive. Sound this word of grace to all who the heavenly pathway leave. All who linger, all who fall. The hymn 243.
Let's again seek the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our eternal God and gracious Heavenly Father, once more we bow before thy throne of grace in our Savior's precious and peerless name. We come pleading the infinite merit of his atoning blood and his perfect righteousness as we draw nigh to thee. As thy people, we do give thee thanks and praise for this thy day. We thank thee that thy hand has been upon us throughout the hours of today, and thou hast enabled us to gather in this evening hour here in thy house, that again we might sit under the sound of the precious word of God. We thank thee for all of thy goodness to us. We thank thee and praise thee for all of thy mercies, even the tender mercies of our God this day. And we rejoice that even now we can come before thee and cry unto thee and call upon thee, knowing that thou wilt hear our cry and that thou wilt attend even to the voice of our supplication. We approach thee, for thou art the one who is rich in mercy, rich in mercy unto all those that call upon thee. Thou art indeed a just God, Thou didst justly condemn thy son to die because our sins were imputed to him. And we praise thee that thou didst justly raise him from the dead because our sins were expiated by him. Oh, we thank thee that thy justice will indeed have that manifestation of an acquittal forever for our sins. And we thank thee and praise thee that thou art a just God and a Savior. We think of those words that were spoken by the enemies of our Savior when they said, This man receiveth sinners. And we praise thee that thou dost still receive sinners. Thou dost still receive all who will come, all who will call upon thy name. Thou dost receive them to pardon all their sins. Thou dost receive them to cleanse them from all iniquity. Thou dost receive them to justify them, to declare them righteous in thy sight in accordance with thy holy law. And, O God, we ask tonight that as the word goes forth in this meeting, that there will be the call of God heard in hearts, that effectual call of the gospel. We ask that thou wilt call sinners to thyself, that there will be those tonight who will be brought under conviction of sin. Realize that they need to be saved and Jesus Christ is the only Savior. O oh Lord, come and make that plain to them. Give them an understanding of the way of salvation. Some may have heard it for almost a lifetime, but yet they have never come to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. They have still gone on in their sin, traversing the broad road to destruction. Oh, we cry to thee that thou would show them mercy again this evening, that, O oh God, as they sit under the sound of the word in the gospel, that, oh, they might realize that they're a sinner condemned and they will perish in their sin unless they repent and believe the gospel. Lord, we do ask that thou wilt move upon all of our hearts as we come to read thy word. May we hear thy voice speaking to us. And then as we come to preach forth in the message, oh, we ask that thou wilt take thine own word and bring it home in the power of thy spirit to every heart in this meeting, to the hearts of thine own dear people. May their hearts be glad and rejoice as they sit under the sound of the gospel once more. And oh, may any who are backslidden at heart, any who are cold at heart, Oh, that they might return even to their first love. So we spread this great need before thee. We acknowledge and we confess that the need is so great that we cannot meet it of ourselves. But Lord, thou art able to meet it. And so we bring it to thee. We cast our burden upon thee. And we ask that this meeting will redound to thine honor and to the glory of thy great name. Keep the meeting covered by the blood. We're conscious that the evil one would seek an inroad into this meeting to draw away our thoughts onto things that are temporal and that are of no eternal value. But, O oh God, we pray that our hearts and our minds would be fixed and focused upon thy word, which is truth. O oh, meet with us here and bless us, we pray, for we ask all these things 
in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We we'll sing another hymn, the hymn 702 on page 459. God is always near me, hearing what I say, knowing all my thoughts and deeds, all my work and play. The hymn 702. We'll find our scripture reading in the New Testament scriptures in Matthew's gospel, the gospel according to Matthew and chapter 13, the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel, and we'll commence our reading at verse 36. Reading from the 36th verse of the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel, let us hear the word of the Lord. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away so shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. Ending our reading there at verse 53 of the chapter, and we know that the Lord will add his own blessing to the reading of his precious word for Christ's sake. 
Amen. Just at this point in the service, I'd ask our brother to come, please, and make the announcements to you. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome along to our gospel service tonight here in Coleraine Free Presbyterian Church. It's good to see you here, and you're very welcome. And for those visiting with us, we give you a special word of welcome. And also those joining on our webcasts, uh, we bid you welcome to the meeting also. We want to welcome back our preacher for today, Reverend Leslie Curran, of course, no stranger to us, and we enjoyed his ministry this morning and look forward to hearing the message in the gospel this evening. The announcements then for the incoming week in the will of God as follows. Tuesday night at 8, the prayer meeting and Bible study. Um, the speaker, the Reverend Derek Irwin, our under moderator. Friday at 3, the open air witness just outside the town hall uh, there in the town centre in Cold Rain. And then the service is next Lord's Day, 11.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. when the preacher is the Reverend David Linden. And there will be a communion service following on from the morning service and using those little pre-filled cups again uh, that we've used over the last number of months. And again, just to remind you, those are not gluten-free, so if that applies to you, then please bring uh, your own piece of bread with you uh, next Lord's Day. Then looking ahead to our Holiday Bible Club from the 15th through to the 19th of August, uh, coming very close to that now, so please do remember that outreach in your prayers and invite others to come. And if you're able to help with that, then please put your name on the list there on the table in the church uh, porch. Revival conference from Sunday the 28th of August through to Wednesday the 31st of August. The preachers are Reverend Ron Johnson, Reverend Gordon Ferguson, Rev Reverend Timothy Nelson, Dr. Paul Ferguson and Reverend Roger Higginson. And then as we've been mentioning, the gospel mission plan for September in Harpers Hill. For the Ladies' Fellowship, uh, please note they're having a dinner in the Lloyd's Hotel on Friday the 26th of August, and all ladies are invited to attend that. And if you want to go, please put your name on the sheet there on the table and also indicate your menu choices as well. I had mentioned this morning those who uh, need our prayers at this time, and just an additional request to that, uh, Caroline Cochran's brother-in-law, uh, his name is Rainey Aiken, is going for major surgery tomorrow in the Royal. So please do uh, pray for him and pray for that family circle at this time. Pray for the sur surgeons as well, that they would uh, know wisdom and help. And do remember Caroline's sister in the family circle um, at this time. So I believe those are all the announcements that made subject to the will of God. And we'll hand back now to the Reverend Curran. Thank you. I do thank our brother once again for making those announcements. I appreciate that very much indeed. He did mention that I could take a moment just to speak to you about let the Bible speak. I don't have a great deal to report other than to just say that next year, uh, the Lord willing, uh, we will mark the 50th anniversary year of the Let the Bible Speak ministry. That will be for the radio ministry, it will be the 50 years. It certainly won't be the 50 years from the commencement of the television ministry. But we do have that combined ministry. The programs are still going out on radio and going out on the Revelation channel on the Sky television. We're thankful to the Lord for the response that we have had by way of listeners' letters. Thankful to the Lord for hearts that have been touched and we cannot say how many the Lord has been pleased to move by his spirit and bring them to saving faith in Christ. But we do believe the Lord is using his own word as it goes out over the airwaves week by week. One thing you could remember in prayer would be the work in Nepal. Uh, we're hoping that the station that we made an appeal concerning in all of our congregations, uh, that appeal did raise a considerable amount of money, over 30,000 pounds, to see the establishment of a, a station that would be dedicated to the ministry of the word and to the preaching of the gospel. And uh, step by step, that is coming to fruition. And I would ask you just to remember that in prayer, uh, that the Lord will be pleased to continue to lead and guide in every way and in every aspect of it. Uh, so there will be a station there that will be preaching forth Christ 
and him crucified. Can I, in closing, just express a word of sincere thanks and appreciation to you as a congregation uh, for your interest in the work, for your prayerful support of it, and also for your financial giving to it. Over the years, almost the 50 years now, as I've indicated, the Lord has met the need. We've always said that if we go in accordance with his will, then we can come to the throne of grace with confidence and ask the Lord to meet the necessary expenditure in carrying out his will. And he has always honored that, and he always honors his promise. He always keeps his word. And we have certainly proved the faithfulness of our God over all of these years. So continue to pray for the work and for all of our ministers who take part uh, by way of uh, supplying messages for the radio and also for those who come to Lurgan. Uh, we have recording sessions there every few months uh, for the television programs. And if it was not for uh, my colleagues in the ministry helping out in this way, then it would be impossible for us to carry out the number of programs that we do carry out. And uh, we rejoice in the willingness of them to come and to preach the word. So do keep it in prayer and continue to pray for the Lord's blessing and for a further extension of the work because there are still many areas of the world where we would like to be and we can only go there as finances permit. But the Lord knows that and we leave it all in his hands. We're going to sing another hymn now. It's the hymn 222. The hymn 222 on page 266 for those who may be using the hymn book. Come ye sinners poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. The hymn 222 singing verses 1 to 4. Verses 1 to 4 of the hymn 222.
Let us again come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, again we draw nigh in our Savior's name, thankful that Thou hast drawn nigh to us. Thou hast again fulfilled Thy promise. We have been seeking Thee with the whole heart, and we know that we have found Thee. And we ask that as we turn now to the preaching of Thy Word, that Thou wilt come even nearer still. O God, we need Thy help. I need again the fresh infilling of Thy Spirit, so that the Word will go forth in the very power of God. Thou knowest the need of each heart, and we pray that Thou wilt take Thy truth and apply it in the power of Thy Spirit. O grant that tonight there will be someone who will discover the treasure, who is indeed the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. O God, come and minister to us each one, and bless us now as we continue before Thee. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. This 13th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, from which we have been reading this evening, we find that it records a number of parables. These parables have by many been referred to as the kingdom parables. In them, the subject of the kingdom is central. In parable after parable, we have the word kingdom. For example, in Matthew 13, verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. You can go down to verse 45, the very next verse, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. You come down to verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. I think I need to say at the outset that when we speak about the kingdom of heaven, we are essentially speaking about the kingdom of God. Because when there's reference in the scriptures to the kingdom of heaven and also to the kingdom of God, it is one and the same kingdom. Because the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are used interchangeably. And I think we have a, a proof text or texts for that assertion when we go to Matthew's Gospel chapter 19 and we read verses 24. 3 and 24, we find these words. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 24, And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So in verse 23, we have the kingdom of heaven, and referring still to the rich man in verse 24, we have it called the kingdom of God. So they are really synonymous terms and they are used interchangeably. We're not going to go through all of the parables that are recorded here in this 13th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, but they all relate in, in different ways to the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. These kingdom parables, they, they set forth the character of the kingdom. They tell us about the growth of the kingdom, the development of the kingdom, and so on. But there are two of them, and they emphasize another characteristic of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And that characteristic is just how precious that the kingdom of heaven really is. They emphasize the preciousness of the kingdom. We see that from verse 44. Let me just read a few verses again from verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. So those two parables, they speak to us about just the preciousness of the kingdom. One is speaking about the treasure, 
The other is speaking about the pearl of great price. These two parables, they have some aspects or some points that we could say are in common. What might they be? Well, there's an object of supreme value that is to be found in both of these parables. One parable speaks of treasure, and the other parable speaks of the pearl, the pearl of great price. So there's an object of supreme value mentioned in both of them, and for this to be acquired, that is the treasure that was discovered in the field, and the pearl of great price, if it was to be acquired, it was going to be acquired at a, at a great cost. By that I mean there was going to be the selling of all other assets, so that the treasure that was discovered could be possessed, and likewise the pearl of great price. So they have certain aspects and certain points in common. But there are also points of difference. In one of them, the treasure was discovered, but it was discovered unexpectedly. It wasn't sought for. We read of it there in verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. He had been there in the field, and then he discovers the treasure. He didn't expect to discover it, didn't even think it would be there to be found. But then we have the point of difference, the point of contrast in that second parable. There's someone, and they're out seeking on purpose out seeking for, looking for, wanting to find, wanting to discover a goodly pearl, one that will be of immense value. And when he has found it, then he's willing to sell everything else in order that he might possess that pearl of great price. It's the first of these two parables that I draw your attention to. The one mentioned in verse 44 about the kingdom of heaven, like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. The Lord Jesus Christ is the real and the true treasure. And so with that theme in our minds, we come to, just for a little time, Examine in some more detail this, this parable of this treasure that was hidden in a field which this man found and then he came into possession of it. First of all, I want to speak just briefly about the, the presentation of the parable. The presentation of the parable. As in all of the Savior's parables, we find that the Lord Jesus in speaking forth in these parables, he was using objects he was speaking of circumstances. He was referring to events that were undoubtedly well known to all of his hearers. He wasn't going to deal with something that would be unfamiliar to them, something that they had never really heard of before. What would have been the point? But the Savior knew the particular object to speak of and refer to or the particular event in the parable that he was relating to the hearers who were gathered to hear what he would say. And here in this parable, he's relating this treasure being found. It's hidden in a field and there's one who goes forth and discovers it, brings tremendous joy and gladness to his heart but he has got to get into possession of it. And how is he going to do that? We might ask the question, well, why, why was it there in the first place? We're not told why it was hidden in this particular field. The identity of the person who discovered it is not told to us either. We're not giving a, given a specific name nor are we given any details about the one who owned the field in which the treasure was hidden and then was discovered and was found. There are many, many questions that we could ask, 
many questions that we could ponder and think over and we really couldn't supply any answers to them. Why was this individual in this particular field on this particular occasion? How was it that he was in the part of the field where he actually discovered the treasure that was hidden there? You see, in those days, uh, I don't think there was any such thing as uh, having uh, deposit boxes or going to the bank and putting something in safekeeping. In fact, it's told by some commentators that those who had considerable wealth, they would probably have really divided it up into about three parts. They would have had one third, that would have been for their business use if they were in a business. Then there would have been another part that they would have went and they would have bought some precious stones so that they would have been able very quickly to take those with them if the circumstances turned out that they had to flee for some reason. They could gather the precious stones and they could go along with them. And then there was the other third and sometimes it was said that they would have taken part of that and they would have buried it somewhere somewhere that they would have known where to go and find it. But it would have been unknown to others. No one else would have known of the place. I think we sometimes hear, sometimes it's maybe said in the joke, oh, someone has got so much stacked away under the bed or under the mattress or something like that, put away somewhere in a safe place where no one knows about. That may be what happened here. Why was this individual working in this particular field? What was he doing? He may have been laboring, he, he may have been plowing, maybe he was doing something else. And he had no idea, he had no thought in his mind at all that there is a wonderful treasure to be found here. There's a wonderful treasure that's hidden, that's buried, and then suddenly he discovers it. He might have felt in itself, well, it's, it was just accidental. I just happened to be in the right place, in the right field, at the right time, and I, I have discovered this, this wonderful treasure. But if we try to make an application in the gospel, aren't there so many who go through life and they never really think about eternal things? The salvation of their soul never seems to cross their mind. And if it's mentioned, they very quickly put it out of their mind. They want to get the conversation on to something else. They're not really interested at all. And this individual who was coming here to this field had no thought about the treasure that was there. Nevertheless, it was treasure that he was to discover. And when we think about the application in the gospel, aren't there those who have found the treasure, the Lord Jesus himself, and before that they, they weren't seeking? I think of the, the woman at the well. You remember how she had come to draw water? That was all that was upon her mind. She had no thought about her soul, about her soul's salvation. And yet it was there that the Lord Jesus had the opportunity to speak to her and turn her mind and change her heart completely. And she discovered that he was indeed the Messiah that he was indeed the greatest treasure of all. Sometimes there are those who have received a gospel tract. Maybe they, they took it from someone who was giving out tracts, witnessing, or they may just have found it lying somewhere and opened it and began to read it, and the Lord dealt with their heart, and they were brought out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God's dear Son. But they hadn't been seeking, they hadn't been looking, but the Lord in great mercy and the Lord in sovereign grace, he saved them. Here's this individual, and he's not searching for any treasure as such, but he discovers it. This is something of the presentation of the parable. But I want in the second place to draw your attention to what I'll call the identification in the parable the identification in the parable. This is the parable about the, the kingdom of heaven as some of the other parables are about the kingdom of heaven. 
and the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. We said earlier about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God being terms that we can use interchangeably. And when we think of a kingdom, we probably would think of a king. And when we're thinking of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, it is God himself who reigns and who rules in his kingdom, the kingdom of his grace and the kingdom of his power. And the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is that kingdom in connection with the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting just to take a few moments to trace through various scripture references about this kingdom, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. The kingdom comes. When does the kingdom come? We read about the kingdom being near, the kingdom being at hand. The kingdom comes when the king himself comes. And we have a reference to that over in Matthew's gospel. Matthew's gospel chapter 3. Let me just read the opening two verses. Verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand is at hand. At this time, the Lord Jesus, who is indeed the king, was going to present himself in his public ministry after he had been baptized and then begin his public ministry. And he indeed is the king in the kingdom of God's grace and the kingdom of God's power. Then when you turn over to Matthew's gospel chapter 4 and another verse that speaks of this, But let's read from verse 16 just to get the context. Matthew 4 verse 16. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king himself has come. To invade the kingdom of darkness. It's reference to the kingdom. Turn over a little further in Matthew's gospel. We go over to Matthew's gospel chapter 10. And here we have some words that are spoken to to the twelve as they would would go forth. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 7. And the word to them was this. And as ye go, preach. Preach. Saying, and what were they to say? What what was the message they were to proclaim? The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the word spoken to the twelve as they were to go forth. That was their mission. They were to go and preach concerning the kingdom of heaven being at hand. The very same message has to be proclaimed when the seventy were sent forth. And over in Luke's Gospel, Luke's Gospel chapter 10, there we have the words in verses 8 and 9. And the words are these, And into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, here's the message, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. It's the message of the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God's grace and power. And then when we move from the Gospels to the Acts of the Apostles in Acts Acts chapter 20, here we find the Apostle Paul at Ephesus. And he's really summarizing his time of ministry there. And in Acts chapter 20, Well, let's read from verse 20. He says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. But then just for the sake of time, drop down to verse 24. 
He says, None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone, preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. So what's Paul saying? He says, I went amongst you. And I went amongst you preaching. And I was preaching the kingdom of God. So what was Paul preaching? He was preaching the gospel. He was the great gospel preacher. He was the great evangelist. He was the great missionary. And he was preaching concerning the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come. And the kingdom of God has come in the person of the king. And here in this parable, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, and again the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. Here's the truth. Here's the truth that this parable identifies. The discovery of the worth, the value of Jesus Christ and the salvation that's found in him. And when that discovery is made by any man, any woman, any sinner, when that discovery is made, then there will be a cause for great joy and gladness and rejoicing. And there will be nothing that will keep that individual from possessing Christ and having him as Lord and Savior, and of experiencing God's salvation in Jesus Christ. So the treasure is the Lord Jesus Christ, and all that is stored up in him, he who is the King of grace. This particular field was of no real interest to this individual, until the treasure was discovered. And then in his joy of discovery, he goes and he sells all that he has to buy the field, make the application. When a poor sinner discovers the beauty of Christ and the worth and the value of the treasures of God's grace in Christ, then he or she is ready in the joy of that discovery to dispense with everything that would keep him or her from Christ and his so great salvation. Perhaps this individual had ties to many things. Some of them may have been of what we would describe as a, as a sentimental nature. Some of them would no doubt have been of considerable value at least to that person, maybe of considerable financial worth. But when he discovered this treasure and he was taken up with the treasure, he was willing to part with everything in order to be the possessor of the treasure. No matter how many things may have had a strong emotional tie to his heart, things that he had set his heart upon, things that he loved, things that he cherished. But now everything changes and he cannot rest until he has the treasure in his own possession because he sees that treasure of more value than anything else that he thought he had that he classed as being valuable. But he knows he can't have the treasure unless he has the field. And that becomes most important to him. And in his joy, underline those words, in his joy, he doesn't do this reluctantly or unwillingly or half-heartedly no, with a whole heart, he sells all he has so that he might buy the field in order to possess 
the treasure. You see, that's the identification that's here in the parable. But then in the third place, I want you to consider with me the illustration of the parable. The illustration of the parable. And this parable is illustrated for us in the lives of individuals in Scripture. We've already mentioned him, the great apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus as he was before his conversion to Christ. And as he writes to the Philippians, we find in, in chapter 3 of Philippians that he, he's really giving a word of testimony. He's bearing testimony to what the Lord has done for him. It's always good to give a word of testimony, isn't it? To have a testimony to give. To be able to speak forth and tell of what the Lord has done for your soul. How that the Lord met with you and you met with him and how he saved you. And as Paul writes to these Philippians, that's exactly what he's doing in this third chapter of his letter to them. The opening verses read, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. What he was really saying there to them was, if anyone thinks he has what will purchase God's favor, I, I can do far better than that person. I could do far better than that individual. And then he begins to list all the things that were as treasures to his heart. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He, he, goes, he goes down the list, tells of all the treasures that his heart was set upon, all of the things that he would have said before his conversion that he counted as great gains. But then in verse 7 he says, what things were gained to me those I counted loss. Like the individual in the parable that we're looking at. I counted them all loss for Christ. For Christ because he is, he is the great treasure. Paul was saying here these things that he has just listed. He says these things as I viewed them. They were so valuable that I would have said they were my very salvation. That's in effect what he was saying. But then everything changed when the Lord met him. As he was on that road, the Lord broke in upon his life. And what he discovered made all the difference. And he speaks of it there in his testimony in verse 8 of Philippians 3. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. A remarkable conversion because of a remarkable discovery of the greatest treasure of all, the King of Grace, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Do you know him? Can you say with judgment day honesty of heart, he is my greatest treasure. I, I have come to know him. I've come to trust in him. I've come to believe on him. He's my savior. He's my Lord. He's my redeemer. He's mine. He's mine. What we've just noted here in Paul's testimony 
to the Philippians in that third chapter stands in marked contrast, in marked contrast to another individual that we read of, another young man. We read of him in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19. He seems, in one sense, to be like that merchant man who was seeking goodly pearls. You remember what we read there concerning this individual? How that he was the, the young man who was inquiring about eternal life, how he, he could be saved. Verse 16 of Matthew 19, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? The most important question anybody could ask. How can I be saved? You couldn't ask a more important question than that. And this young man's asking this vital question. And what's the response of the Savior? Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, if you'll have life, then you keep the commandments. And this young man's responding really well. I've, I've really kept all the commandments. I've kept them really from a very young age. What lack I yet is the question he poses in in verse 20. And what's Jesus' answer to him? Verse 21, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell. Go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, and follow me. What he's saying to him is this, young man, if you would, if you would be complete, if you would know the blessing of eternal life, Here's what you must do. You must sell everything that you have. And what's the Lord Jesus offering him? What's the offer? The offer to this young man is you'll have treasure in heaven. That's the best place to have treasure in heaven. Thieves don't break through and steal there. Moths don't corrupt there. That's what the Lord Jesus is really saying to him. The parable that we're considering, that man discovering the treasure in the field, he can't have the treasure unless he has the field, and that becomes more important than the things that he loved and the things he thought he would never, ever part with. All of those things that he had set his heart upon. But here's this. Here's this young man. And he hears the words of the Savior. The Savior's offering him treasure in heaven. And the Savior's own companionship. Because he says, thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Follow me. Why did the Lord say that to him? Why did the Lord answer him in this kind of a way? It was to reveal something. What was it to reveal? It was to reveal if he had come to the place where he had really discovered the treasure. This young man had very strong ties to his present treasures, and he had many of them many of them. And at the top of the list of all of his treasures was his money. And all that that money had given to him and continued to give to him. He has come here to the Savior. He calls the Savior good master. The Lord was a good master, but he was more than that. He was God incarnate. And eternal life, which this young man said he was seeking, was bound up in him, in Christ himself. He's really saying to him, young man, have you seen 
in me the treasure of all treasures, above all of your accounts, above all of your assets, above all of your titles to land, to property, whatever it might be. Because if you have, you will with joy sell all that you have and you will have a treasure in heaven that can't be touched by anyone and you will have me as your saviour and your companion. And you would say, well, who, who wouldn't choose that? Who wouldn't choose that? Well, this young man didn't choose that. We read in verse 22, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see, he still saw his treasure in the things that he could touch and see. He didn't see Christ as the treasure hidden in the field for whom he ought to joyfully, gladly give up all that he might have eternal life. And he goes away sorrowful because he didn't see the worth of the true treasure. You see, the blessing of salvation is only had in Jesus Christ. And if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't have salvation. You don't possess eternal life. Sometimes people have the idea, well, I'm enjoying life so much at the moment and I, I think if I were to come to Christ, life would be so dull. You wouldn't be able to do this and you wouldn't be able to go there. But that's, that's not the Christian life. The Christian life is a, is a joyful life. It's a glad life. You remember those words that we have as Paul wrote to the, the Romans in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. He spoke about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy. Joy in the Holy Ghost. The Christian life is not a doleful, wretched life. It's one that's full of fellowship and joy in the Lord and fellowship with the living God. Are you seeing Christ tonight as the treasure that you must have? Did you come to the meeting and you had no real thoughts about the salvation of your soul, but as you've sat under the preaching of God's word, the Lord in his grace has enabled you to make a discovery it's Jesus Christ that you need. It's God's salvation that you need to possess and have. Because without it, there'll be no heaven for you. There'll be no heaven for you. There'll only be hell. And the young man that we've just been speaking about went away sorrowful. He didn't obey the Lord. Will you go away sorrowful from the meeting tonight because you refuse to obey the gospel, to turn from self and sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and have him as the greatest treasure of all? Oh, I urge you to come to him. You need to come. Go through the scriptures and note the number of verses that you read of that speaks about coming to Christ. Think of the gospel invitations that have that word in them, come. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's gospel rest, but you need to come. 
Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. That's plain, isn't it? That's straight. That's to the point. If you come to Christ by repenting of your sin, turning from it, and believing on the Savior, he says, I'll not cast you away. I'll receive you. I'll save you. And you'll be the possessor of the greatest treasure of all and all the blessings that come with it. You'll have Christ. Don't go away without him tonight. Come to him and believe on him. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. Let's bow in prayer. In just a few moments, our meeting's over. But should there be anyone in the gathering and the Lord has spoken to you and you need further questions answered, you need further help from the Scriptures, so that tonight you would come to Christ and have Him as your Savior, your Redeemer, the pearl of great price. Then make it known to us. We'd be glad to spend time with you, help you from the Word of God so that you will come out of the kingdom of darkness and enter into the kingdom of God. Don't delay. Come, just as you are. Come and welcome to the Savior. Heavenly Father, in our Savior's name, we give thee thanks for thy presence in this meeting. And we pray that thou wilt take thine own truth, bless it to every heart, and especially to hearts that know thee not, Grant that there would be those who would make that great discovery that there is a Savior waiting to save them if they will but come. Grant them that grace that they will come, that they will call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Separate us now in thy fear and with thy blessing, for Christ's sake. Amen.